So, um, why are we um, talking about bus priority? Um, there, there is a challenge, there's a very interesting um, set of statements made um, earlier this month by First Group, um, who uh, have large operations all over the country. Um, they, uh, in particular, were um, talking about Scotland. Um, so, in Glasgow, uh, like many other places, we'll make the slides available uh, afterwards. Um, certainly these, I think, uh, Tom's might not be, but everybody else is. is. Um, in Glasgow, um, uh, what, 15 plus years ago, a service needed 12 vehicles to uh, operate. Now it needs 18. Um, because of uh, congestion um, and uh, running speeds on the road network. Um, uh, where do you get that resource from? Well, you either get it from uh, uh, cutting other services uh, or you cut that service so that it's less frequent or you have to put prices up significantly um, to get more resource in to buy more buses and pay more drivers. Um, so, you know, I thought that was quite a useful, prescient thing just to think about, you know. That's why we keep talking about bus priority. Um, and that's the challenge that, that we're faced with uh, pretty much everywhere, not just in Glasgow. Um, however, you know, when it goes right, um, like in Aberdeen, um, they make 25% um, journey time savings from some bus priority. There's a little bit of traffic, a bit of physical stuff involved, um, but you know that's quite significant, um, and that encourages people to get back on the buses. Um, and um, they, as a result, you know, save money so they can give it back to passengers, and you get into a cycle. Of, uh, of positivity because the more people you get on the buses the less cars you've got on the road of course which means the journey times improve for everybody um, and so uh, by solving the bus problem um, you, know, you can actually make some significant uh, impacts to people so that's why we're talking about bus priority and it's so important Okay, so um, what are some of the technologies? I am aware I am speaking to a lot of you who will know an awful lot about this, um, but it's worth um, picking it, you know, just, just making sure that um, we're all on the same point. Um, we've got a bit of the background and the history before we start to talk about what next, actually. So um, if we go back... Um, quite a long time now um, but interestingly it's coming back so you put a tag a bit like an NFC tag in your bus um, you have to fit it in the right place um, you then uh, cut some loops in the road and we all know how dodgy those are over time um, and hopefully you detected the right bus going over the right loop and then you did something about it um, and uh, that Actually, when it works, can be really quite successful. Um, uh, Ken Fast Track um, did it um, to great success. There was some great success in Barnsley, um, to the extent that when it didn't work, the buses just sat there and uh, waited forever because the track they were on a you know on a segregated bit of bus lane and they were never going to get a green light if it didn't work. Um, but. <laughs> The 90% of the time that it did, it was really effective. Um, so I say back in time, interestingly, um, in um, some of the Far Eastern countries and uh, in India, um, people are beginning to start to play with tags again um, because um, it seems to work reasonably reliably. Not quite with the same sort of loops in the road and things like that. They're on the side of a road in a controller where they're less likely to go wrong and things like that. But actually, it's, it works. So, you know, we shouldn't necessarily discount things that were done 
you know, back in the 80s and earlier. Um, then um, people moved on to local communication where the bus would to talk to the traffic light. Um, been done for many years. There's an RTG, stand, RTG UTMC standard um, for that. It was quite widely used in the UK. It is still quite widely used around the world, that approach. Uh, a lot of it in Europe, a lot of it in the States still. I still see press releases about um, new Lisa installations in the States. It's, uh, it's interesting. Um, but that moved on. Um, particularly as more UTCs came along um, and so the bus might talk to the traffic light which then talked to the UTC and went what do I do? Um, and now I've got a bus coming um, and rather than it all being controlled locally UTC got involved um, there were some latency issues and the time to drop out of Scoot and things like that and get back on board and things like that um, but um, that worked uh, quite well. There's a standard um, for that. Um, it needs local radio, you need kit in the bus, you need kit in the signal controller, um, all of which needs maintaining and making sure it carries on working. Um, and um, there are only, I think, a very few in use in the UK. It's pretty much largely been superseded. Um, I think they're, you know. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any large-scale schemes doing it anymore. Then, um, back in about 20 years ago, um, a form of central control was uh, implemented where the bus would use its private mobile radio network um, because uh, GPRS was too expensive and too unreliable. Um, with gaps in coverage and things like that. Um, cue some of the thinking for some of the questions that some of you have asked in a bit about unreliability and gaps in radio in mobile phone coverage. Um, so, um, but that sent it to some form of central management data broker for traffic light priority, um, which then passed it on to, uh, to UTC. Um, and that evolved... Um, subtly over time um, to um, actually using um, uh, mobile data you didn't need the private mobile radio networks um, they became more and more difficult to manage and implement as Ofcom put more licensing restrictions in and screwed the price up um, but um, as coverage for mobile phones got better, you know, why do you need it? And why do you need a separate black box on the bus when the ticket machine was changing to something that was much more flexible and more akin to a computer that did a number of things on bus um, as ticketing systems changed so that rather than the driver were having to uh, say, oh, I've moved on on my journey um, and I've changed the fares that I'm going to do because I've moved on from one fare stage to another. Um, you know, uh, drivers have a lot of things to do. Um, that was a bit unreliable and so uh, that was automated through GPS and things like that. Well, if you've got a GPS that knows where the bus is and the ticket machine's doing things, why can't it pass that back to uh, the centre and things like that? So real-time systems um, evolved and started using that, um, particularly as bus companies started to learn the benefit of understanding what was happening on their buses, rather than expecting local authorities to pay for it. Um, they were actually wanting that data analytics themselves uh, for their own uh, benefit. Um, and so therefore the need for or the desire to have a local authorities bit of kit on the bus as well as their ticket machine uh, sort of uh, became more and more uh, troublesome for operators and so these days um, some systems still work like this most of them though um, are multi-operator so you've got lots of different operators feeding into data brokers sometimes uh, straight to UTCs 
Um, there again is a standard uh, for that, um, RTT031, um, one of the conversations that I think we probably want to have today is what do we do next with this, um, because some of the questions and conversations um, that we're going to have I think might mean that we want to evolve it a bit, um, but it includes um, you know, lateness and priority requests um, and I'm going left or I'm going right and things like that. Some things not everybody's using at the moment um, so actually there's potentially more that could be done um, through this which is already reasonably well implemented. Um, the bit that isn't and is only just starting to be implemented is something that was put in place probably about 10 years ago, um, a feedback mechanism um, because all of the conversations so far about bus priority have been here's a bus and the bus is going I'm here, do something please um, and actually what happened as a result of that request to do something just wasn't very well known and there was no feedback mechanism and so uh, a feedback mechanism was put in place but that's only just beginning to be started to be used in anger by uh, a reasonable number of people um, and again it's developed by uh, Artig and UTMC. Um, then um, Mover um, where you haven't got UTC, um, lots of that going on, uh, it seems to work pretty well um, from a bus operator's perspective. Um, so uh, you don't need lots of the hassle and the effort that goes into managing the other forms of bus priority. Um, there's probably more work for traffic managers and configuration engineers to do uh, to keep on top of uh, making sure things are pointing in the right way and things like that. But you're probably more in control of your time than you are of an operator's time to update things on their bus. Um, so um, you've got mover, then um, other approaches um, increasingly um, a real-time system is um, making decisions about when to request priority rather than the bus, um, whether you realise that or not um, through virtual triggers and things like that. So historically you've needed something on the bus um, to say I want this bus to request priority for this junction when it's at this point um, that whenever anything changes needs to be updated and that's one of the real challenges certainly on a large scale system um, where you're constantly changing bus routes you're constantly playing with signal timing um, and uh, you know, large conurbations um, like Leeds and Joel sends his apologies he can't be here today really struggle with keeping on top of it where because they're quite active in trying to manage um, bus priority um, uh, they're updating their trigger files and updates the buses every couple of weeks um, a constant effort to make sure that every bus has got the right file on and things like that so increasingly troubled so actually how can you get rid of that well actually you can do something similar by uh, making that decision about where the bus is and when to request uh, priority in a, another system rather than the bus having to do it. Um, and there are sites in Lincoln and uh, uh, Oxford's doing something and Seb I think will talk a bit about it in a minute um, briefly um, about how that's working. Um, other things we've talked, why is that? We've talked about that. Um, and then um, one really for this afternoon, um, people are beginning to um, play with high frequency updates. Traditionally, a bus has sort of said where it is every 30 seconds um, and then made a decision you know, when it gets to a trigger point to send a message for priority. But the general, I'm here, 
um, you know, which you can use for long-term journey planning and you know, where is the bus sort of every 30 seconds. Um, a lot of operators now, it's sort of 18 seconds on average, I think, um, those update, location updates, but people are beginning to talk about, well, what can I do if I know where that bus is really, really frequently, you know, like every second? Um, what could we do if we knew about that? Um, and how could we manage buses differently um, if we knew more about exactly where they were in relationship to each other and other vehicles? Um, what could we do differently? So people are beginning to think about that and um, some places uh, in Europe are beginning to use that because they have much cheaper uh, mobile phone data sims and things like that. So a lot of the challenges that have existed in the UK um, aren't there. So places like Copenhagen, they're pl been playing with this sort of, um, it's not every second, it's about every two seconds. Uh, you know, what can we do um, with a very, very high frequency of updates? So um, that's a quick run through um, of some of the different types of priority. So hopefully that brings you all, reminds you of the dim and distant history, which may not be so much of the history, interestingly, um, and uh, some things that some people are thinking about. So um, with that in mind, um, what are one of the key suppliers to the sector um, doing?